morning, folks. Welcome to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host. We're in luck because we're on the agronomy farm here on the campus of K-State. And if you'll remember, the last show we had featured the Sorghum Field Day. Well, we're in luck because we're going to continue the spotlight on grain sorghum. And so get your cup of coffee, come on back, and we'll talk to some more researchers about grain sorghum production. Closed captioning brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress, powered by Kansas farmers. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Good morning, folks. Welcome to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and we're in luck because we're at the agronomy farm and we're still talking about the agronomy field day that we have. And last, last session we talked to Tesfai Tesso, our sorghum breeder here at K-State, and uh, talking about some of the, the drought uh, and, uh, and cold tolerance that he's developing. And, and uh, Tesfai, tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the other aspects of your breeding program. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the sugarcane aphid. Well, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the other key focus of our breeding program was to enhance yield potential by developing materials that have enhanced traits that contribute to yield. Sure. And then one other thing that is, came up in recent years and then threatening sorghum production was the sugarcane aphid. Mm -hmm. We haven't started any research on that one. and. Uh, it was the first time that it showed up in our field, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it is the first time to see even the insect. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, after we noticed that the insect was in the field, we started scouting our materials. And as we do that, we saw very significant differences between different lines, between different hybrids in terms of sugarcane aphid infestation. Right. Right. One thing that was very interesting that we noticed was that there is uh, a high, an experimental hybrid that was planted next to one of the commercial hybrids that are on the market, this one. Uh -huh. And then this particular material was heavily infested by sugarcane aphid at that time. Probably this is still, vis the effect is visible. Oh yeah, you can still see the damage. Yeah, but standing next to that was an experimental hybrid that did not have a single insect on it. And we're, we're only 30 inches away from the other one. Exactly, it was uh -huh. 30 inches away from the other one. Normally the insect is attack the lower part, the lower side of the leaf. Uh -huh. This one did not have a single insect on it. This one carried just, just ta tens of thousands of insects on it, basically. Okay. So we were very impressed. We didn't make any effort to breed for sugarcane aphid resistance, but this is what uh, happened by chance. And I am not sure whether it is a male part or the female part of this hybrid that uh -huh. has a resistance in it. So now but you got to go back and look at the two we go back. We know the pedigrees, we know where they come from, basically. Mm -hmm. So we are going to explore that and then try to... Well, this, this basically tells you you've got genetic diversity for a sugarcane aphid, right? Definitely. You know, it really sent a very big panic when it showed up. And then especially the rate with which it's really invaded sorghum fields over the last right. couple of years. Right. But when you look at your genetic resources that are already available, you know, it is, it is just going to be a matter of time to come up with a hybrid that is good and that can also resist sugarcane aphid very well. So okay. that is a good genetic resource out there, it looks like. Tesfai, thank you for telling thank us a little you. bit about the, uh, the sugarcane aphid resistance that you have here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsor. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. Tall Grass Commodities offers producers bulk commodities at a reasonable price with reliable service throughout the whole Midwest. To find out more about Tall Grass Commodities, visit tallgrass.us or call 785-494-8484. 
Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and with us we have Dr. Brian McCornack. He is a researcher in the Department of Entomology. Brian, we've been hearing about sugarcane aphids you know, coming in, uh, and we, I guess we had a little bit late last year, so kind of tell us the we, we've got lots of aphids, so now we, we got a new one. We've got all summer. We got a new one, so tell us about the sugarcane aphid. Uh, sugarcane aphid is actually a new pest for us in Kansas, like you said. Uh, last year, though, we didn't really get it until late August. Mm -hmm. And this year, our first reports of it were Sumner, Sedgwick County, uh, late July. But given the population sizes that we saw, they're most likely here early July, which means two months more here to feed and reproduce than they were last year. So. Okay. Reason more time to do damage. More time to do damage, right. So we went from two counties infested last year to uh -huh. well over 20 this year. Okay. Uh, and even, even so, we started at two counties this year, but went and blew up within a few weeks' time simply because crops are at the right stage. We had enough aphids coming in. This is a migratory pest, so it's not local overwintering. We're, we're dealing with populations that are coming in on the same events as corn earworm mm -hmm. coming from Texas and Oklahoma mm -hmm. and from making us at, at our doorstep. And all of a sudden, we went from very few to lots to have to manage within a few weeks time. Okay, so did the weather pattern, obviously the winds from the south really right. helped, but did uh, the, the, the moisture that we had in the summer and, and maybe cooler than normal help as well? Yeah, I guess the, the, the cooler temperatures not so much. The cooler might have helped them slow down a bit. Actually, mm. they're, they're a warm season aphid. Right. So you look at green bug, they, they like the cooler temperatures, but the sugarcane aphid likes the 90 to 100 degree weather. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. They're more actively feeding, they're sucking that plant dry, they're reproducing more. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to thrive with it. Natural enemies don't thrive at those hotter temperatures. So okay. uh, when they cool down, it might give natural enemies a chance to, to catch up. Like uh, the ladybugs. Like lady, yeah, ladybugs and lace wings. Uh, and now we're seeing clouds of lace wings come out of kind of some of that untreated sorghum. So, the, and natural enemies do well, but it's just a, it's a numbers game and uh -huh. timing, uh -huh. uh, especially if you're looking at difference between managing early season sorghum and late season sorghum. So early season, you might have had two two months to manage it. Uh -huh. uh, you got a two week pre harvest interval for the two products that we have uh, that we recommend, which are Transform and, and Savanto. We'll, we'll talk more about we'll talk those. Talk more in about a that, and you know, versus a late season where you've got maybe three or four months to manage it. So. It becomes really important to, to scout early, scout often, and know before you spray. That was our mantra this summer because these populations can change quickly. Okay. So why is this critter so difficult to control and uh, what damage does it cause? Those are two questions there. Okay. So the, the damage can be what we call a physiological loss. So it's, it's, it's sucking the nutrients dry. So it's see, like the energy that went, yeah, what it went into the seeds is now being, is now being removed. The other is mechanical. So Later season and late late stage infestations and the and the aphids actually being in the heads mm -hmm. at the time of harvest can cause the plants to be or the seeds to be sticky, and that's where you've seen you that's know that, that's har that honeydew the honeydew yep yeah, so it's a byproduct of the aphid right so they're secreting that as they feed right and that's what's been clogging clogging the combines and mm -hmm. you know from Texas to Oklahoma but. For us, it's, it's understanding when, where those populations are within the plant and how close they are to moving up into the heads. But most of what we see is physiological loss. I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how difficult it is to control them and, and why the reason for that. But we got to take a break. So folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. Heinen Brothers, a fourth generation Northeast Kansas farm family, knows how tough farming can be. Farmers helping farmers. Heinen Brothers Ag, selling and servicing crop protection products, fertilizer, anhydrous ammonia, cover crops, quality aerial and ground application. Call today to learn about our extended term financing program, 800-760-4964, heinenbrothersag.com. 
The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, and Brian McCornack didn't run off during the break here, so thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the physical yield, uh, yield loss, mm -hmm. uh, but what about uh, the difficulty in controlling it? You know, they're on the underside of the leaves. That's exactly right. And they can be trapped in the, in the boot as well. So, you know, we've got some, that, we, we got some issues here on controlling it, so kind of tell us about that. Yeah, the, the, the biggest issue is coverage. Uh, so we've got, of the product. We've, of the product. So we've got two products that we've been recommending, and they're, we call translaminar, which means they need to come in contact with the leaf. Uh -huh. The leaf needs to soak it up, and then the aphids need to actively feed on it. Okay. So if you spray the top leaves and you're expecting to translocate, that's not going to happen. It's not going to move to other parts of the plant, uh -huh. which is why you need good coverage of those two products. So the Savanto and Transform are the two that have been working in, in replicated field trials the best. Uh, and it's mainly because you don't have to come into contact with the aphids, but you can come in contact with the leaf. Mm -hmm. Aphids feed on the leaf, they get the toxin, and then they, and then they die. Okay. But if you don't get good coverage in the canopy, okay. and they're in the lower parts of the leaf earlier in the season. Well, 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 on the lower part right, of the plant, okay. Lower part of the plant, yes. If you're only using five, you know, at least five by air, 20 by land. We're talking and, gallons. As far as gallons per acre. Mm -hmm. And so that means you're getting good coverage but you need to get penetration down into that canopy where the aphids are mm -hmm. so that you actually get good efficacy in your kill. Right, right. So um, what about other other critters besides the sugarcane aphids? I mean, we got the corn earworm. Uh, yeah, corn problems. earworm, sorghum headworm, and it's, the thing is it's, it's moving on those same weather events. Okay. And so the likelihood of us dealing with sugarcane aphid in the future is also going to be kind of coexist with these, these corn earworms. Okay. Uh, so managing those in the long term Chances are it's going to be managing at the same time. Well, product-wise, you're talking about using products the, are different, though. That, that's what I was wanting to yep, get to. Yeah, products are different. So typically, we use pyrethroids and organophosphates and, and some others that work pretty well with the, with the corn earworm. Uh -huh. But if you're using the same pyrethroids and organophosphates for sugarcane aphid, you're not getting contact, um, and you need because you need contact to kill them. Right. What you end up doing then is removing all those natural enemies that are on the leaves because right. they're more susceptible to those pyrethroids and organophosphates. So you can then actually flare your aphid populations by choosing the wrong product for your corn earworm. I'll be darned. So if you put if you put the corn earworm product in, but if you know you have treatable levels of aphids, then put your transformer savanto in at the same time. Okay. Otherwise, you're, no otherwise you're going with the pyrethroid, like you said, you're going to take out the good good you're bugs. Out the good bugs. Yep. You're taking out the good bugs, and uh, we don't want that. And letting the, letting the bad bugs kind of wreak havoc, like you see here. I mean, these are this is a naturally infested field. Uh, populations are. Uh, definitely beyond treatable levels. This is luckily for us an experimental plot, but uh -huh. uh, it, it documents within a few weeks' time populations can build to treatable levels. Okay. Brian, I really appreciate you taking yeah. time out Appreciate between time. Yeah. between stops on yeah, the absolutely. field day here. My pleasure. And because uh, this is something we're really going to have to pay attention to in the future. Absolutely. Exactly. Brian, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Folks, stay with us. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. Tallgrass Commodities offers producers bulk commodities at a reasonable price with reliable service throughout the whole Midwest. To find out more about Tallgrass Commodities, visit tallgrass.us or call 785-494-8484. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tallgrass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, and we're fortunate to have Dr. Curtis Thompson with us, our extension weed scientist. And uh, Curtis, we've been talking about this new technology in sorghum. Um, 
with herbicide resistance uh, for, for a few years now. So kind of give us a little update on this new technology, what it's called and how it's going to be used. All right. Well, thanks, Jim. It's great to be with you. Um, yeah, the, the, the new sorghum that has, and we'll call it an ALS-resistant gene, is Inzen sorghum. Inzen, I-N-Z-E-N. Mm -hmm. I-N-Z-E-N. OK. Uh, that is, that's been branded by DuPont, okay. who now has the, is the ownership of, of this technology. But several years ago, of course, we developed it mm -hmm. here at K-State. Uh, we were using in corn, this is prior to uh, the Roundup Ready corn, we were using a product called Accent or Beacon uh, right. to try to control shatter cane in corn. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a good job until resistance developed. Sure. Uh, they were able to move the gene from this resistant shatter cane mm -hmm. into sorghum. Okay. And uh, so now this Inzen sorghum uh, technology, uh, the main purpose of that is to allow us then to use one of these ALS grass herbicides, mm -hmm. okay, to uh, be able to control grasses post-emergence post uh, okay. in sorghum. Now, grasses have always been a problem in grain sorghum, so we've depended on pre-emergence herbicides. Right. Uh, they can be very effective mm -hmm. if we get timely rainfalls, mm -hmm. but unfortunately sometimes it doesn't rain. No, you're So <laughs> grasses come up uh -huh. and uh, it's usually a lost case in grain sorghum. And so with this technology, it will allow us to come in and spray post-emergence on an Inzen sorghum hybrid okay. uh, these annual grasses uh, with this herbicide and hopefully get effective control. Okay, so let's go back to the annual grasses. Which ones are we talking about? Crabgrass? Well, we've got several. Crabgrass, okay. uh -huh. uh, and crabgrass is one of those that's a little tougher. We've got to spray them when they're small. Okay. Very small. We're talking less than two inches. And how big is the sorghum okay. at this time? Well, it depends on. Well, I think we're going to have to go based on weed size Not more sorghum. than sorghum size. And it won't okay. hurt the sorghum. Either. It's the, at this point, mm -hmm. uh, we may see some slight yellowing in the sorghum, but it doesn't seem to stunt it or slow it down, and it doesn't seem to be any kind of a yield drag. Okay. And so, uh, but most important is to get these grasses. Uh, what, what, other, what other grasses besides crabgrass? Well, grass? we can do a good job on foxtails. Okay, that's, that's good. That's the giant foxtail, green foxtail, uh, yellow foxtail. Uh, we have excellent control of uh, barnyard grass. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we've got good control of volunteer wheat. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, which is, I mean, a lot of times sorghum's planted after wheat, and we do have volunteer out there. And uh, that happens to be one that'll come through a lot of our pre-emergence products. Right. And so this will allow us to clean up volunteer wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have shatter cane mm -hmm. in a field or Johnson grass in a field that is sus ALS susceptible, right. we can get very good control. Okay. Uh, the problem is uh, we've got probably too much ALS resistant shatter cane around mm -hmm. and so Folks are going to be unhappy if they use this technology thinking they're going to control shatter cane and it's ALS resistant. Kurt, we've got to take a break here for just a second. So, folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. I'm a patient of the Kansas Regenerative Medicine in Manhattan. I had uh, stem cell therapy in my hips and my left knee. My wife and I, uh, both are patients. We went down there the same day in November. Since then, uh, my hips are feeling a lot better. I can, can work now most of the day if I want to. And uh, before, if I, if I worked in the morning, I was done in the afternoon. Or if I worked in the afternoon, um, I was sure enough done for the rest of the day. Tallgrass Commodities offers producers bulk commodities at a reasonable price with reliable service throughout the whole Midwest. To find out more about Tallgrass Commodities, visit tallgrass.us or call 785-494-8484. No matter where, no matter why, the Veterinary Health Center at Kansas State University is committed to providing quality patient care to animals and exceptional customer service to their owners. From routine checkups to emergency and specialty care, our world-renowned specialists and experienced professionals are here to discover, to teach, and to heal. 
Let us know. How can I help? How can we help? Another gardening tip with Annette Jackson. Fall is a great time to plant trees, shrubs, and perennials. Root development this fall means more growth with less watering next year. For faster root growth, always use Fertilone Root Stimulator. It is the only stimulator which contains IBA rooting hormone. Use Fertilone tree and shrub food after the plant has been planted for a month. Save 25% now on Jackson's homegrown hardy perennials. Let Jackson's friendly staff help you select the best plants for your landscape. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer. We're in the, at the agronomy farm. We're still talking to sorghum at the sorghum field day. We have Dr. Curtis Thompson with us on this last segment. and We were talking about Enzen sorghum mm -hmm. and that ALS resistant gene that's in it. What's the chances of a possibility of that jumping to uh, chatter cane or Johnson grass? You mentioned the, there's already a population yeah. out Re there. Re remember the gene came from chatter cane? Exactly. And so a cross was made from chatter cane onto our uh, sorghum lines. And in fact, uh, the gene will uh, return to uh, chatter cane uh, just as simply. Okay. And so that does mean that we do have to do some, some uh, stewardship mm -hmm. uh, practices to try to prevent mm -hmm. uh, the uh, gene from flowing from this, this field into the wild populations. Uh, that maybe means you have to look around your field and find out whether or not you've got sorghum relatives mm -hmm. adjacent that maybe need to be mowed down so that those seed is produced. Uh, I think on the label they're going to uh, prohibit planting sorghum after Inzen sorghum because we always have volunteers sure, sure. which uh, we have to be able to manage. Okay. And so it's going to, I mean there are some things that we do have to uh, do to try to prevent uh, the gene from moving uh, to the, the wild population because we know it can. Right, right. Yep. Okay, so this isn't a silver bullet for all post emerging grass issues we still we still have to think about pre-emerging as well a absolutely uh, this is a tool in the toolbox okay. uh, but we're still uh, going to be recommending that a pre-emergence uh, product be used that gives you grass and broadleaf weed control well, what example of that what would be a good well a, a good example is you know if I if I use the uh, chemical name we'll say uh, Esmetola chlorine okay. atrazine, right. or it might be dimethenamide and atrazine. Okay. Uh, you know, the chlorocetamide group of herbicides we'll with atrazine uh, will really help out on grasses and gives us some broadleaf weed control. Right. Uh, we have way too many resistant broadleaf weeds, in other words, that are ALS resistant, and so we do have to depend on other chemistries okay, to so, manage so, broadleaf so weeds. So we we're talking about a pre-emerge. Okay, and we're talking about the, this uh, Enzyme using this as a post-emerge, but then we have the broadleaf. So you're talking about at the same time of using the post-emerge uh, grass that we're talking about uh, uh, putting a post-emerge uh, broadleaf herbicide in it, there as well? And it's going to depend on the broadleaf species okay, that sure. you have uh -huh. uh, available to you. But if you're, if you're out west and you have kochia, uh -huh. uh, yeah, we're going to have to have a dicamba type product. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the tank with zest in order to get kosher control because otherwise we we won't uh, we won't control it with just zest. Okay. Um, if we have you know pigweeds, uh, you know it might be 2,4-D okay. uh, that we have in in the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's going to have to be some other broadleaf component if there's broadleaves present at the time of the the application. Kirk. Appreciate you taking time to talk to us this morning. Pleasure to this. be with you, Jim, and uh, pleasure to be with That's My Farm. Okay. Folks, thank you for being with us on this uh, session of uh, That's My Farm. And don't forget, this time next Friday, we'll have another show of That's My Farm. See you then. Closed captioning brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress. Powered by Kansas Farmers.